Hello and welcome to Digest This, where we discuss a clinical topic in gastroenterology. My name is Francesca Moroni, I'm one of the gastroenterology consultants in the north of Scotland. Today we are discussing cytosponge and I am delighted to welcome Mr. Paul Glenn, an upper GI surgeon from the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Glasgow. Welcome Paul and thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So, Gastroesophageal reflux disease is one of the commonest referral to secondary care from primary care and often GP refer patients that don't have red flag symptoms. However, as experts on the matter, as gastroenterologists or upper GI surgeons, we always worry about Barrett's esophagus in patients with long-standing symptoms. But what is actually is Barrett's esophagus and what is the prevalence in UK population? Traditionally from the literature, we know that around 10% of patients who are referred up with reflux symptoms have Barrett's esophagus. Now Barrett's esophagus is changes in the lining of the esophagus, normally a um, squamous mucosa, but with exposure to acid or bile over a number of years, we get a columnar lining with goblet cells that's characteristic of intestinal metaplasia. Now this in itself might not cause any problems, there are a lot of people who have Barrett's esophagus that doesn't progress any further, but uh, with time we can see ongoing changes of low grade dysplasia to high grade dysplasia and then even to cancer. So we know that uh, Barrett's esophagus is part of the pathogenesis of esophageal cancer. So, of course, this is an implication for a patient that is diagnosed with Barrett's, but what does this mean in practical terms for the patient? When we find out a patient has Barrett's esophagus, uh, the recommendations are that they have a clinic consultation or some patient information uh, to let them know of the diagnosis. Um, at this point, we would usually recommend that they take a higher dose of uh, PPI um, and we would offer them the entry into a surveillance programme, um, which would involve, depending on the length, uh, the total length of the height of the Barrett's esophagus, either three yearly or five yearly endoscopies, where we ask for very specific biopsies to be taken. Um, the Seattle protocol uh, biopsies require quadratic biopsies, uh, so looking down the endoscope north, south, east and west and then come back two centimetres and do the same and then come back two centimetres that should cover the whole length of the Barrett's esophagus. Well, clearly this means quite a lot of endoscopic procedure to be performed and during the last 18 months during this COVID-19 pandemic, above all in the first and second wave, we had to suspend a lot of our routine endoscopical service, including surveillance. And so, as a consequence of this, there's been spark of innovation throughout NHS. Do you think Cytosponge fits into this and how did it come about? Well, at the time of uh, COVID happening, we knew that there was a lot of patients having repeat endoscopies that were just parked on a waiting list. And we were worried because we knew a percentage of them would have some changes in their Barrett's esophagus. Um, there was a group set up with representatives from all of the health boards in Scotland uh, to try and think, how can we, what, what can we do? How can we uh, get beyond this point? Endoscopy was already struggling. Uh, there was more of a uh, demand than a supply for endoscopy, so we were already on the back foot. Around this time, there were some advances in uh, pill cams or uh, breath tests or um, cytosponge was the one that I was most interested in. Um, the Professor Fitzgerald's lab in Cambridge had been uh, developing cytosponge over a number of years and there's been the best studies to uh, assess its uh, sensitivity and specificity in picking up Barrett's esophagus. Now this was initially aimed at primary care. Uh, this was initially aimed as a screening tool to see if patients did have any sign of any Barrett's esophagus. Um, so in their studies all the patients that had cytosponge also had an endoscopy shortly afterwards. Um, so we were happy that this did have a good sensitivity and specificity for picking up Barrett's and dysplasia from Barrett's. So we uh, discussed this and we felt that this could be used to um, screen for our Barrett's population in the absence of any endoscopic service. How does it actually work? Well. The advantages of cytosponge over an endoscopy are it only takes one um, nurse to come in and do it. So 
From a logistic point of view, from a patient journey point of view, we were sending out forms to say we don't have access to endoscopy at the moment. Um, we have been uh, developing a new service with Cytosponge with some patient information in it. And that told the patient that it would come in, it was described as a sponge on a string. So it is a small um, pill-shaped uh, sponge that's compressed within a gelatin capsule. And that capsule dissolves in water. It's meant to dissolve in about five to seven minutes. So the patient holds on to the end of the string. Uh, the sponge gets placed on the back of the tongue and then they drink down lots of water. It doesn't require any sedation or local anaesthetic. And it means that the patient can walk in and walk out. Um, the sponge goes down the esophagus into the stomach where the gelatin capsule dissolves and the sponge expands out to about three centimetres. And it's a, a, a soft malleable plastic, but it's rigid enough that it uh, keeps its shape as it gets drawn back up through the esophagus. So after seven minutes, the string is withdrawn and we get a good sample of the lining of the esophagus. So who should get a cytosponge and who should not? Well, with the aim of this being uh, developed to focus on the primary care population, uh, we had agreed that patients who presented with predominantly reflux symptoms could be offered this in lieu of a normal endoscopy service at the moment um, and it would help to triage to endoscopy. Uh, we get uh, a result saying that there is inflammation, uh, we get a result saying if there is atypical cells, uh, we get a result saying there is Barrett's esophagus and occasionally we do find that P53 positive markers are uh, present so they were more concerned about these patients. It can also screen for uh, other conditions like eosinophilic esophagitis and candida, these can be reported on the pathology slide. So as good as a diagnostic tool, we just we don't have that uh, body of evidence in real life practice that shows that it, it can be used instead of endoscopy. But at the moment, we feel that this is a very good tool that we can use and, and help to closely audit these patients and uh, generate uh, uh, evidence along these lines. Um, so we are offering it to patients with predominantly reflux symptoms um, and then they can come in and they can meet the nurse, they can talk over their symptoms, they can perhaps get some patient uh, education, some patient uh, leaflets and hopefully get a reassuring cytosponge result or a cytosponge result that would uh, help us triage their urgency of endoscopy. And so what do we do with the results? So who follows the patients up and what is the pathway from that? Um, this is this is run differently in different areas. For um, for example, there are some in Lanarkshire. Um, it's a, a lot of the follow up is done with uh, the nurse endoscopists who are performing the procedure at the moment, uh, acting on the results and uh, providing patient information with the a named consultant uh, for that area who can uh, help uh, in greater glasgow and clyde i've been we've been focusing more on barrett's esophagus surveillance which we can come on to mm. um and actually i've been looking at all the results myself and uh, um, generating the patient uh, information leaflets and the follow-up from that well, clearly you just touched upon this but you have quite personal experience in your local area because i know you've been leading the service in great glasgow and clyde so it'll be quite good to get an overview and how has it been and top tips for other health boards that would like to take this on well it was a little bit more difficult than i thought setting up the procedure i think that uh, it it took a little bit longer everything whenever you're trying to set up a new service, everything always does. There's always a little bit more red tape than you imagine. Um, you, we, we had to train our nurses to be able to do this. We chose to uh, train endoscopy nurses, first of all, um, because they were familiar with the anatomy. They were able to speak to patients and seek out red flags. And we also wanted them eventually to be the trainers uh, and have a little bit of uh, leadership uh, in that. It doesn't need to be a nurse endoscopists that do this. This can be done by... Um, by anyone uh, who's appropriately trained uh, in the procedure. But we did feel we wanted that at the start. So we had to train up the nurses um, from uh, Professor Fitzgerald's lab down in um, Cambridge. Uh, one of their nurses came up and uh, showed our nurses what to do. We had a supervised list over two days where two of our nurses were trained. And subsequently, they've done the training, the trainers course, and they've been able to train up other nurses in Glasgow. And that's, that's uh, been spread across Scotland, uh, that same pattern. Uh, the other logistical issue was finding patients, making sure patients were appropriate for cytosponge, 
getting a place to actually do it. Now, it doesn't need to be an endoscopy room. It can be done in a clinic room. As I say, this was initially set up for primary care. It needs somewhere where there is a computer, a seat and a jug of water uh, so that the patient can uh, drink down plenty of water with it. Um, so it doesn't need to be an endoscopy room. But even that took a little bit of time to sort out. So all these things, if you're setting up a service, have to be thought of. Who's doing it? Where's it going to be done? The samples get transferred down to Cambridge at the moment uh, and then they get analysed there. Very shortly afterwards, after about a week or so, we get an email back from their lab with the result. And then there's the results governance side of things as well. And the results generally can be categorised into a few standard response letters that we've come up with over time. So we've got about six letters that we send out, send out to patients. There's always going to be the odd one that needs a little bit more clinical input, but uh, we're, we're, we're happy that we've got our system worked out now and um, raising a few questions about the certain groups of patients about what we do further down the line, but we're, we're gaining more experience of this. We've been going for over a year now in Glasgow. You mentioned that in your local experience, you use the cytosponge service uh, as a surveillance system for the patients on the waiting list for the balanced surveillance endoscopy. So what impact did that have on the endoscopy waiting list? The endoscopy waiting list remains as it is for all repeat scopes for category three and category four uh, repeat endoscopies in Greater Glasgow and Clyde, which I'm sure is reflected across Scotland, these scopes were not getting done. We were really concentrating on the category one and category two diagnostic scopes that were being performed. We, my big concern was that there were patients who were on a waiting list that we weren't sure were and they were ever going to get done. And there would be a small percentage of these patients that had dysplasia or even cancer. So the Taking these patients out of the equation at the moment and targeting our limited endoscopy report to the patients who are at highest risk of having pathology has allowed us to work through our Barrett's uh, surveillance list and we're actually now back up to time with that without having a big impact on the endoscopy uh, service as it has recovered. We are now uh, much better positioned to perform our Category 1 and Category 2 endoscopes than we were maybe even six months ago, nine months ago. So Cytosponge just seems to overall tick all the boxes, is cheap, is little, little invasive, potentially portable, and is much more environmental friendly than endoscopy would be. But where is the catch? I think the catch at the moment is we are doing something that there is not an evidence base behind. This has gone from being uh, performed in very much controlled study situation, the best one, two and three studies uh, have uh, demonstrated that it's safe and have demonstrated that it's uh, effective, but we've never used this in a real world population. Um, and I think that's something we have to be very careful of. Uh, we don't know what impact that will be. I think the advantage we have at the moment um, and a, that allows us to do that is we don't have an alternative and we are offering something where we would be offering nothing. Um, setting up this service, we have very carefully audited all our results. We've got database uh, in every region of every patient that's had cytosponge. And I think we are gathering that real world information that would have taken a little bit longer to gather uh, if had it not been for the COVID pandemic. Um, but we are being very, very careful. We're probably being over cautious with some of our patients that we're scoping, but I think that's the right thing to do. And we, I suppose the, the, the big concern is what's going to be happen, what happens to the patients that we push them out to their next surveillance interval having had cytosponge and not having had an endoscopy, which is our current gold standard. Is there any final thoughts you want to share with us on the setup of the service, how it's going to run through, or the future of cytosponge in Scotland? I think that my hope is that eventually we will have a screening programme to assess for Barrett's, and we're always worried about setting up a screening programme, do we have the resource for it? But as a clinician dealing with esophageal cancer, we so often see late disease presenting and there's usually we're in the situation where the patient is only suitable for palliative treatment. 
I think that we, if we were able to target patients in that reasonably long lead-up period of Barrett's esophagus, low-grade dysplasia, high-grade dysplasia cancer, um, then we may be able to prevent needing palliative chemotherapy, uh, esophagectomy and high dependency, critical care stay, all these very expensive things. So I think that perhaps the future for Cytosponge sponge would be in changing esophageal cancer from a condition that we mostly palliate to a condition where we find it before it's an issue. So we, we, we've still got a little bit of work to do uh, from that point of view, uh, but certainly at the moment I'm very happy with the results we've had in our reflux patients and our uh, Barrett's patients across Scotland. Bright future ahead for Cytosponge then? I hope so. Well, all is left for me to say is to thank you for this excellent run through a very hot topic and to thank you for joining us for Digestis. <laughs>